Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Juan Carlos Brando, and it's for me, it's a pleasure to join everybody there where you are at your house, maybe having lunch, maybe just before having lunch. Uh, it depends on the place that you are. But thank you so much for letting us get there and uh, give you some information about immigration. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with the attorney, Noor Chamas who is one of the experts in the law firm, uh, talking about cancellation of removal, asylum application, uh, and many other areas, but specialized in these two areas of the immigration law. So let's welcome the attorney, Noor Chamas. Um, hello, attorney. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, attorney. And well, we have heard a lot of rumors since last year about asylum, that the rules are changing, that they want to change some of the rules uh, for the people that can apply for asylum, people that don't qualify to apply for asylum. So what what, what is changing about this uh, kind of application that we know is an international right that people have according to um, the United Nations and some treaties uh, in the international uh, law? Um, well, I mean, there's not anything changed about the asylum application itself, they can't do that. That's by law. They have to actually have Congress would have to change the law if that were the case. Um, what they're trying to do is, and they haven't done it yet. This is something that was proposed. And I think there was a bill in Congress that they were trying to pass, which was to make it more difficult for people to qualify for the asylum process. Currently, if you come to the US and you come to a port of entry and you say, I'm afraid to go back to my country, they have to put you through a specific process to determine whether you are able and you have the qualifications to file an application for asylum. That process is called the credible fear process. It is uh, basically a process whereby you will be interviewed by an asylum officer. And all you have to show is that you have a credible fear of persecution in your country. And upon showing that, then, uh, you know, if, it's, if the asylum officer agrees that you do have a credible fear, then you are referred to immigration court where you will be allowed to file an application for asylum. The question is now is whether they're going to change that process and make it more difficult to qualify to file for asylum. The standards of asylum, the asylum application itself, are a lot higher than the credible fear process. The credible fear is supposed to be just a screening process to see if you have the basic uh, requirements that will allow you to file for asylum. So that's that's really what's changing, not, not the actual requirements for asylum and not your right to file for asylum in the US because that can't change unless US law has changed, which only Congress can do. Yeah, one of the rules of the asylum or one of the recommendations for the asylum applications is that people should file before uh, having presence for one year in the United States. So what is different if I don't do it in the first year, but I do it when I have 18 months in the United States or two years or one year and two months? What changes after one year? Okay, so what happens is um, now this, this was changed in 1996 with the new law, which came into effect in 1997. What happened before that is people were just filing for asylum at any point. It doesn't matter when you enter the U.S., you can always file for asylum. So um, uh, in order to uh, make it more difficult for people to file for asylum, because they uh, Congress thought that people were abusing the process, they said, well, if you actually have a fear of returning, in order to qualify for asylum, you have to file your application within one year of entering the United States. If you do not file within one year of entering the United States, then you would not qualify for asylum unless you fall under one of the exceptions to the one year filing requirement. Uh, those exceptions can either be extraordinary circumstances, which means that something happened in your life that prevented you from being able to file for asylum. It could be any number of things you could have 
you, you know you could have been suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder you could have uh, you know had a death in your family you could have there's there's things that you can say prevent you, you could have hired an attorney to file the asylum application for you but they failed to to do their job and then that that could be sufficient to show that you um fall under that exception the other exception is uh changed conditions those can be changed country conditions meaning that something changed in your country that then uh caused you to have a fear of returning so let's say let's say you came uh you know from iraq and uh, you know there was uh, you were here for many years and nothing was happening and all of a sudden there was a, a coup in your country and now there's a dict military dictator there and now you're afraid to go back so as long as you file your application within one year of that event that occurred then you would fall under that exception also and then there's also changed you know personal conditions so let's say um you know you come from you came from mexico and you came into the us you haven't filed your asylum within one year it's been many years but all of a sudden let's say you have a brother in mexico and that brother was targeted by the cartels for whatever reason and now they're targeting your family. So now you can say, well, I, now I'm afraid to go back because of what just happened to my family in Mexico, and I will be targeted if I go back. So that could be also a sufficient exception to the one-year filing requirement. Mm -hmm. However, if you have no exceptions, you will not qualify for what is called asylum. You do qualify for something else. It's called withholding of removal. And that is the same basically the same application as asylum but it carries different benefits with it uh it does not it does not uh allow you to become a lawful permanent resident it just allows you to stay in the us and to uh obtain a work permit um until such time that maybe conditions in your country change or until such time as a third country is willing to take you um but ultimately a lot of people that end up qualifying for withholding of removal will stay here indefinitely like not, usually nothing ever changes but um withholding of removal actually has a higher standard to meet in order to qualify for it and it does not carry the same benefits as asylum yeah that's a lot of requirements and people uh, have a lot of risks in these kind of cases uh this process has been has been becoming tougher right it's, it's like more strict, more requirements. Some conditions are not considered like enough to uh, for a kid to be considered with a serious illness. Um, right. I mean, in yeah. general, it's this. So you, with asylum, um, a lot of times it depends on which judge you have, which court you're in. If you, if you file it affirmatively with USCIS, it's which officer you get. Uh, in ger general. There has been like there has been an increase in the number of applications that people file for asylum so they're more strictly scrutinized um there are specific requirements there are specific elements you have to show in order to qualify for asylum first thing you have to show is that uh you were you suffered past persecution in your country um now past persecution could be uh you know a, either a physical um, or emotional, psychological harm uh, that was severe enough in your country um, that you suffered uh, because of a specific characteristic that you have that certain people didn't like. Um, so that would be uh, considered persecution. If you do show past persecution in your country, um, then you uh, are deemed to have what is called a rebuttable presumption of future persecution. That means the court will presume that you will suffer persecution in your country in the future, but the government can come back and rebut that presumption, meaning the, the government of the US can come and say, well, country conditions have now changed. So uh, there's no longer that, even though, even though that, that person did suffer persecution in the past, there's no longer a well-founded fear that that person would suffer persecution in the future. Not show past persecution, you still can show what is called a well-founded fear of future persecution. It means you say, well, I wasn't harmed in the past, but given conditions in my country, if I go back now, I am afraid that I will be persecuted. That fear that you have has to be both subjective, subjective meaning that you actually are afraid 
of going back. And it has to be objectively reasonable, meaning that if you look at the objective country conditions of that country, it has to make sense. It has to be reasonable that you would actually be afraid to go back. And you have to show that your persecution would be uh, on account of one of the protected groups in asylum law. And those are race, religion, national origin, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And you also have to show that that um, persecution is either at the hands of the government or, or agents of the government or at the hands of people or groups that the government is either unable or unwilling to control. Um, so you have to meet all these elements in order to qualify for asylum in order to succeed in an asylum application. Well, that's a very uh, complete or very, very specific explanation for these kind of cases. So thank you so much, Attorney Noor, for explaining so well these details on the asylum applications. So if you have any questions, please uh, send them. It's free right now on this uh, Facebook Live and YouTube Live that we are transmitting right now. Or if you want to make an appointment and have a consultation with one of the attorneys, you can call the phone number 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. Um, the next question is, hi, I filed for TPS, but I am in removal proceedings. I was told that I need to send ICE a letter so showing that I applied for TPS and to stop the case mm -hmm. and get my passport back. So if you do have TPS, you're actually considered not removable at that point. Um, uh, what, what that I think whoever gave you that advice is basically suggesting that you reach out to the ICE DHS attorney, meaning the attorney representing ICE in immigration court, and uh, showing them that you do have TPS. Because in a lot of those cases, the DHS ICE attorneys will file a motion to dismiss your proceedings. A lot of times the court might also dismiss your proceedings if you have TPS, so you would no longer have to worry about being in immigration court proceedings. And yes, once your case is dismissed, you would be able to get your passport back. If you ha were released on bond, for example, you'd be able to get that bond money back also. Um, so yeah, if you have TPS, you definitely would be able to get your proceedings dismissed. And uh, if you don't know how to do it, I would then obviously uh, strongly advise that you consult an attorney so that it, that attorney can do it for you. But in essence, if you reach out to the um, attorney for the government for DHS ICE, uh, they could very well be willing to file a motion to dismiss also. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Noor. Don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. The next question is, hi, good afternoon. I have an EU visa pending, but my asylum was denied in court. So now they are giving me the option to close or terminate the case, but I'm not sure of what to do because my EU visa is barely starting and I don't have a work permit anymore. So, um, and I'm not sure uh, here what exactly happened in your case, but generally speaking, um, so the U visa process is a separate process from your immigration court process. U visas are filed with USCIS and US, USCIS separately and independently adjudicates that U visa petition. Um, however, a lot of times the court, if it knows that there is a U visa petition pending, um, they might terminate your case so that you don't have to stay in immigration court and you can go ahead and uh, pursue that separate application or petition with USCIS. Now, I don't know when you say your asylum application is de was denied, um, if uh, there was a final decision made by the court. Um, it doesn't appear that there was an order of removal made by the court, so I'm not sure if you have other applications pending with the court. However, uh, in some cases, you could ask for what is called a uh, case status docket. Uh, what that means is uh, in, in a lot of immigration courts, they will uh, put your case in something called a status docket. That means that the case will be kind of set aside 
uh, you will not get a, you will not get a dismissal of your case. You will not get an order of removal. They just put it aside so that they wait for USCIS to adjudicate the petition that's pending before USCIS. Um, now, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that if you were getting a work permit based on your pending asylum application, then if your asylum application was denied, you're not going to get a work permit anymore because the application would no longer be pending. But you also have an option if, say, the court denies your application for asylum and orders you removed, you, you can appeal that judge's decision to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And once you appeal the judge's decision, that decision is not final. So technically, your asylum application would continue to be pending during the appeals process, and you could still renew your work permit at that time. Um, now, uh, there's a lot of things to keep in mind that you also have the potential of getting a work permit through the pending U visa petition. I would consult and speak to an attorney as to whether or not you'd be able to do that. If you already have an attorney working on your U visa petition, you should definitely ask them that question. So it's possible that you could actually get a work permit through the pending U visa petition and terminating the case might be a good option for you. Um, you know, not knowing anything else about your case, I would ask you to either call us for a consultation or, or talk to your attorney if you have an existing one. But ultimately, um, that, that's how the process works. Uh, the, and, and I don't know exactly what happened with your asylum application, but termination might be a good thing for you. If you don't believe it is, then I would talk to an attorney to see what else you can do. Well, um, this person is adding one more comment and says, what is the best option to terminate admin clause or fight until the end of the case? Uh, um, I applied for asylum when I had been here for 11 years. Okay, so uh, if, so this appears to be maybe a withholding of removal case. If you uh, if you filed 11 years after you entered the United States, unless you fell under under one of the exceptions that I talked about just earlier, um, I don't know what state you're in. So admin closure may not be an option for you. It depends on where you are. Um, here in Ohio, we're under the Sixth Circuit, so. Admin closure actually is not an option unless uh, you have a uh, unless you're going to pursue a provisional unlawful presence waiver. Um, that's a separate thing that we would we would have to discuss separately. But uh, except for that um, waiver application, you would not actually be eligible to have your case admin closed. However, as I said before, if you do have a pending U visa, a lot of immigration courts could place your case on that case status docket and it would have the same sort of effect as admin closure because your case would continue to be pending. Um, now, if you applied 11 years after entering the US, a lot of immigration courts will, will code it for withholding of removal only, meaning that you still wouldn't qualify for a work permit because it's not an asylum application. Um, and, it, you know, and if it's not an asylum application that's coded for withholding of removal, um, it would not fall under a pending asylum application, and so you will not be eligible for a work permit either way. But again, if you do have a pending U visa petition, I would strongly suggest that you look into the possibility that you that you could qualify for a work permit under that pending U visa. Thank you very much, Attorney Noor. Don't forget, uh, he's one of the experts in the law firm of Margaret W. Warren Associates in the city of Cleveland, but with other six cities across the country, in Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, uh, Columbus, Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And the phone number is just one, 216-279-3984, uh, 216-279-3984. Um, this next question, I have overstayed my visa for almost one year. Is there a way that I can get a work permit? Also, is there an interview? Uh, when you file for a T visa, and how do USCIS investigate T visa? Thank you. Okay, so the first question is, is there where you can get a work permit after overstaying for a year? Number one, there's you, you cannot just obtain a work permit for no reason, um, meaning that there's not, there's not like an application for a work permit that you can just file without there being an, another underlying application. Uh, so you can't just obtain a work permit in the US, you would have to have an, another underlying um, either 
application or status. Uh, so for example, you know, if you, as I said before, if you're filing for asylum and you have a pending asylum application, then you could get a work permit based on that pending asylum application. Uh, you know, if you file for adjustment of status, you could get a work permit based on a pending adjustment of status application and so forth. Um, as far as the T visa, so T visa is, uh, is a visa that is available for people who are victims of trafficking. Um, it's very similar to a U visa. U visa is for victims of certain criminal activities. T visa is for victims of trafficking. But essentially, you have to show, number one, that you were a victim of trafficking. Number two, that you, that you did cooperate with law, law enforcement in order to help them um, pursue uh, or prosecute or arrest the uh, person or the party that was uh, involved in the trafficking. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as you show that, then you could potentially get a T visa approved. You don't, you don't necessarily have to have an interview. Um, they wouldn't interview you. They, they would look at the documentary evidence that you would be providing. You would need a certification from the law enforcement agency that was tasked with either, um, investigating or prosecuting the parties that were involved in the trafficking. Um, so that's how you would be able to get a T visa. Uh, if you cannot show that, if you did not cooperate with law enforcement, um, and obviously if you were not a victim of trafficking, then you wouldn't qualify for a T visa. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Noor. Um, well, and this is a very, very uh, specific answer for your question. So if you need more advice, please give us a call. And the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. My brother had a fight um, and he heard the other guy who started the fight. My brother got arrested and now he's on immigration hold. He entered on a parole and filed for asylum. How bad is this for him? All right, so um, obviously I don't know exactly what the facts of the case is. If he got into a fight, um, well, number one, I need to know if he was criminally arrested. Uh, number two, if he continue, if his criminal proceedings are still in, um, uh, are still ongoing, or whether or not they've been completed. Number three, if they were completed, or what he was convicted of exactly. Now, if he got into a fight and he ha and he physically harmed somebody else, he could be charged with assault or battery, depending on the severity of the um, assault conviction. He could be. Um, under what is called mandatory detention in immigration. That means that um, if, the, if he's in currently in detention, uh, he would not be able to be released by an immigration judge. The court actually would not have jurisdiction to release him on bond. And if he does have a pending asylum application, he would actually have to pursue that asylum claim while he is in detention. That could potentially uh, be um, extremely prejudicial to him because uh, if he's in detention, the case is going to move a lot faster. It's going to be completed within a, within a few months. And if it's completed and he doesn't win the asylum case, he will be ordered re, uh, removed back to his country. So I would need to know more. I would urge that if you have a criminal situation to actually call an immigration attorney and talk to them, because a lot of times the criminal issues um, and how they impact your immigration case um, uh, is an extremely uh, complicated topic. Uh, that that would require an expert in immigration law to review it and to tell you exactly what the consequences would be. So I would strongly urge that you do consult an attorney, and we can you can talk to us uh, here. We have a lot of experts in this area, uh, and we would be happy to help you. But essentially, yeah, it could it could prove very harmful for him. But um, if the case has not com com is not complete yet, his criminal case, um, then again, I would also strongly urge you to consult an immigration attorney who can then speak with his criminal defense attorney to talk about what types of uh, con charges or convictions would be um, the least consequential to him. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Noor. And uh, well, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I think it's gonna be very quick. I got my asylum granted, but my wife and kids are still in Guatemala. How can I request them? Um, so 
there is a process where you can request them. There is a form. It's uh, the form itself is the I-730. It's a follow to join. It's a form that you file with USCIS requesting that your immediate family members be allowed to come into the U.S. under asylum status because you were granted asylum. Um, normally, you have to do that within two years of having been granted asylum. So I don't know how long ago you were granted asylum, but um, there is definitely a way that you can bring uh, your family here. Again, I urge, strongly urge you to consult an attorney. Um, these things could be complicated for you. Um, and uh, you don't want to lose uh, your opportunity to be able to file for your family. So if you think that um, that's a possibility for you, please consult us or consult an immigration attorney and uh, uh, see, uh, allow that attorney to determine what you would need to file and when you would need to file it. Okay, our time is up for today. Thank you so much, Attorney Noor, uh, for your time. It's already one o'clock and I don't want to steal your time because it, I, I know it's very valuable. Thank you. Also, um, you are always very busy in the office. So thank you so much for taking some time to uh, give people information and to share your knowledge because we see that you have a lot of knowledge about immigration, uh, about asylum cases, about uh, cancellation of removal, withholding of removal, and all of those cases that people are freaking out they, they, they don't know what to do um, and there is a lot of misinformation around uh, about how to get a work permit how to get asylum when i can file it or if i cannot file it so thank you so much for clarifying so many points and i hope to see you next time i appreciate it and that's why it's very important that people consult with immigration attorneys thank you so much and that's true that's why you have the phone number 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, over 15 attorneys working in the law firm of Margaret W. Woman Associates, uh, working to get you an immigration relief. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good lunch. See you next time. And keep joining us in uh, these shows with the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Woman Associates.